All right, everyone, let's get physical. This is a sport thing. Let me hear your body talk. <laughs> yes, I'm on about sport. I'm talking as an insider and an outsider. Um, I come from a very big sporting family. Until 2003, women's sport was played on a levelish playing field, not taking into account class or race, particularly if we look at something like the Olympic Games. It was a sex-based protected category so that there was very stringent testing for things like drugs and women using testosterone. You'll hear the word a bit today. However, it's been bulldozed by a political ideology that justifies biological males, or I'm calling male-bodied athletes, competing against females. Sport is an actual competition between real physical bodies. So it's the ideal place, one of those places, like Janet, where you can see the politics of gender being played out. It's no surprise to me that sport's being used to legitimate the view that biological sex is no longer relevant to women's oppression, their activities or their spaces because sport has a very, very long history of providing legitimacy to political ideologies, particularly repressive ones. If you think about the Berlin Games, lots of Olympic protests. We now have oil-rich Middle Eastern countries gaining big events like World Cup, Cup Soccer in Qatar. You'll be struggling to find too many women spectators at that event just like the recent World Athletics Championships also in Qatar at Doha, where there were only 2,000 spectators in a 40,000 seat stadium, a thousand of those were athletes and officials. The International Cricket Council moved its headquarters from London, the home of cricket, to Dubai, a country with a non-existent history of cricket for political reasons. International matches in here now play to empty stadiums. The, the money is actually in TV rights, not bums on seats. Cricket Australia this year in August released a new policy on women's eligibility to play in women's cricket. And it's based on the IOC, the International Olympic Committee's 2015 guidelines, which define women in terms of testosterone levels, as well as gender identification, but primarily testosterone levels. The Cricket Australia policy divides into two parts, one for community clubs, schools, and another for elite professional cricket. Women have just started to be paid professionally to play cricket in Australia with a base salary of about 90000 for a full-time woman cricketer. Different from the days when we raised money to, to make our own uniforms and to travel interstate. I think it's important to have a look at the faces of the women in these slides today. They are saying what they cannot say to the sports officials. It's about today, I'm going to talk about the policy and some of the mythology that underlies that policy and the ideology. It's not about individual male-bodied athletes, with one exception. And I use the term male-bodied athletes to try and emphasise that this is about the physical realities and sex differences of bodies because that's the basis of the competition. It's not about an invisible feeling. Male-bodied athletes are playing right now for Australia, New Zealand and the USA right now under the current Olympic guidelines. They're playing in handball. This is recent uh, international handball competition. They're playing, doing cycling, weightlifting, mixed, mixed martial arts and track and field, particularly track and field. And all but one of the people in these slides today is competing legally under the current Olympic <coughs> Convention to do with testosterone levels because you're a woman. The first myth 
and it's promoted heavily in the gay press, is that there is little difference in the level of testosterone set for elite females and those for male-bodied athletes. This is the level for females born female. 98% of female athletes, according to the, Internet, the Australian Institute of Sport, have less than two nanomoles per litre of serum, uh, serum testosterone circulating. This is the level that the IOC has set for male-bodied athletes to compete in women's events. There is no overlap. It's not even close to two. The overlap here for male-bodied athletes compete in women's events is within the normal range for male athletes. Pink News said, Cricket Australia announced guidelines permitting trans women to compete in state and national women's cricket teams if they had testosterone levels around those of a typical cisgender woman for at least 12 months. There is nothing that says this is around. It's about 500% greater. McKinnon won the World <laughs> Masters. Oh, I, I could spend the whole 10 minutes on this one. However, you may not know that the woman who qualified fastest in the final to race here withdrew minutes before the final in protest that cycling had become unfair because male-bodied athletes more than six foot tall and 200 pounds were being allowed to compete under the Olympic rules in women's events. Jessica, I didn't know about this one. Jessica refused, won three UK championships in Fells running, like cross country running, refused to have blood samples and testosterone levels checked. And the UK Athletics said, we will take your records and championships off you. A week later, armed with two knives, went to the headquarters of UK Track and Field and attempted to kill the president of the UK and stabbed the two other people, now serving 18 years in prison for attempted murder around testosterone. Women's. Myth two, this one is one that the IOC really pins its hopes on, and it's quite unscientific. Lowering T, or cross-sex hormones, erases all physiological advantages of male puberty. None of these things are erased by cross-sex hormones or lowering the T level to 10 nanomoles. This one's important because we know that women athletes are often affected by their periods and they try and manage that. No amount of training for me to become a faster bowler will increase my height, my hand size on the ball, or the strength of my body so I can bowl another 40 k's faster like the men do. No amount of training by women can change any of those things. Skill and technique can help but the fundamentals of the body can't be changed. The latest research at last is filtering out that is looking at the effects and there has been no effect on muscle strength after 12 months of cross-sex hormone treatment. The IOC is not listening to the science. Fallon Fox has retired but fractured the skull of her opponent in the first two minutes was ex-military and retired because no woman would get back into the ring. They sacrificed their pay and they would not fight Fallon Fox. This is Hannah. The Australian Women's Football AFL League has rules of five nanomoles for women's professional um, football but no, no limit for club football. They refused registration and Hannah went to handball. But this is a club match. She broke another opponent's leg and managed to fracture the coach's ankle at training. You can see by the look, there are four people in this photo who don't believe the myth 
that hormones have erased, have erased the advantages of male puberty. Legal sex and gender identity are supposed to be now the fairest criteria. And this is part of the mythology to make biological sex irrelevant. We have 100 years of data. This is Blithen. You can actually use the athletes themselves as their own control. Blithen played cricket in the men's comp and the women's comp in the same season. She aver he averaged 10 runs per match playing against men, but 104 setting new records in the women's comp. Cece Tefler ranked 200 in the men's 400 metres hurdle and now is the national champion in the women's 400 metres hurdles. You can look at the age at which elite males break the women's world record times and it's that mid-adolescence, 15, best 15 year old boy can run faster than women's world record in 100 metres. So don't tell me biological sex is an irrelevant social contract. To exclude women, to exclude male bodied athletes from sport is a denial of right. There is no human right to play women's sport for everybody. There is just simply no right. Sport is already organised and restricted according to age, weight in boxing, judo, wrestling. There are already restrictions. The Paralympics do it really well for differently abled people in order to try and get a level playing field. In doing, in tr pulling the human rights card, you deny women the right to a fair competition, to safety and well-being in sport, and an equal opportunity to the benefits that come from sporting participation. There are 400,000 women and girls playing cricket in Australia. And with the new policy, Alex Blackwell, former Australian women's cricket captain, urged those 400,000 women and girls who did not feel comfortable or change, changing alongside trans players to go and play something else. They can choose to go to a sport they're more comfortable with. It's up to them. There's an inclusive policy. However, I ask you, what sport can they go to because all of them are operating under the IOC regulation of no testosterone, social identity as female, or if they're elite, it's 10 nanom uh, nanomoles. This is oppression dressed up in an Australian tracksuit, a sporty Australian tracksuit, that has inclusion as its logo. For those of you, oh, I'll just quickly, that's the New Zealand 12 months ago was lifting male, you would know, uh, the Samoan women, the Samoan president, we can see sport used to be a celebration for women of their achievement and amazing results, but the podium can now be used to highlight the injustice that is happening to women uh, in sport. There's only one sport that has backtracked. USA Powerlifting has reversed the IOC policy and is now only having its events open to women who are biological women. For those of you who know and have no interest in sport, there is a rivalry between Australia and New Zealand, particularly in netball and rugby. So I'm going to let Sandy Mannering have the last word. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. That was so informative.